Young people are being targeted in Western society like never before. What can you do to help save them? Find out today with my guest, Dean Sykes. I'm Drenda, and this is Drenda on Guard. Let's get into it. <laughs> Dean Sykes has been on the road ministering for over 30 years. He's been in over 3,000 high schools helping young people realize that they matter. His organization, You Matter, is making a difference. He's written over 30 books and been reaching out to young people. Welcome to the program today, Dean Sykes. Glad Dean, to be here. So good to have you. Thank, Thank you, you for being with us today. Absolutely, I love what we get to do in life. Yes, we do, we get to touch people's lives. That's and right. Just last night, you were with us for Fire and Ice this Man, last week. What and what a uh, life-changing moment that was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's special. You know, when you, when you come across people who have giftings, you want to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And every person watching today has giftings. You know, the, the word tells us, Brenda, that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And I've studied that out. The gifts are plural, but the calling is singular. When mm -hmm. you and I are in our one calling, all of our gifts work together for that one thing God's anointed and, and caused us to go out and do for his kingdom. That's awesome. And you have gifts and callings by mm -hmm. the Lord. You have a calling and those gifts back that up. Yeah. Now, Dean, I see kids being targeted. I wrote the new book, uh, just came out. Uh, they're coming for your children, the fight we must win because I see this conglomerate of attack coming against children. We have more suicide than ever, more yeah. mental issues. Yeah. Kids showing up at hospitals, presenting with mental and behavioral issues that the hospital uh, emergency staff doesn't even know how to handle. Yeah. Uh, they send them over to the trans clinic, right? That's right. their answer. And yeah. there's millions of dollars and a million plus dollars being made on each child. Mm -hmm. One in 10 uh, pornography uh, of users or users is a child 10 and oh. under. Yeah. One in 10, so this is, this is so important. It's an epidemic, it it's is. an epidemic. Drugs, you name it, it's yeah. all, everything's targeting the kids. I and, believe Jesus cares about the kids. Oh, I know he does. And, and if you look, the enemy's always gone after the kids. Yes. He's always gone after that generation. Yes. And because he under, and this is what I tell, I share with students, and, and I've, you know, I've spoken with millions of teenagers around the world, and I, and I come, always come back to this basic tenet, and it is this, if I'm here and you're there, and let's say this cup represents the enemy, if you're a threat to the enemy and I'm not, he's not coming after me, he's right. going after you. Right. Which begs the question, if you're being really under the attack of the devil, what's he know about your life that he's so petrified you're gonna get there, he's trying to talk you out of living it. Right, Moses uh, was oh, a deliverer. Absolutely. And absolutely. warfare against all the boys, yep. Pharaoh put out that yep. edict for them to all be killed yep. when they were born. Yep. And then we saw Jesus, Herod did the same yep. thing, targeted Jesus. This generation's targeted, yeah, they are. and there's a reason. The enemy's strategies never change. Mm. He's not that smart. Right. You know, he, right. he does the same thing. Mm. And so for us, in, in our outreach, you know, and speaking with, with all these young people, I've come to realize that teen, teenage suicide is beyond epidemic. The, the latest stats from CDC tell me that every day in America, 5,600 teenagers attempt suicide. Wow. Let's put that in, a, in most people wow. can't grasp that. Let, let's put it in a visual. In an arena that seats 12,000 people, that arena would fill up every two and a half days with teenagers who in the previous 60 hours had bought the lie. Mm. Wow. That, to me, that's why wow. I get out of bed in the morning. Why? Right. Wow, wow. And as a mom, yeah. as a grandmom, you know, of 12 children, I just, my heart just hurts when I, yeah. Think about the lies of Satan. We were told lies as young people. Mm -hmm. I'm sure mm -hmm. I have a story, the reason why I am right. so passionate to help these kids. I was lied to in school and targeted as, you know, they pull the, the kids that do well because yep. they want to indoctrinate them yep. so yep. they can use them for their agendas. Yep. Abortion, mm -hmm. uh, women's lib, that was the whole push and they were tied together. Right. And so you see that going on as well. What is your story? Yeah. I just like to know yeah. what makes you, what's your passion? Yeah, well, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, became a Christian at seven years old. I'll never forget it. The guy's name was Ray Cleet. He was an associate pastor of Ridgedale Baptist Church on Dodds Avenue in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. Came to our home on a Saturday afternoon. I was outside playing football with my best friend, Chris Frank. He's, he led me in a prayer. I felt something different. I went outside. I said, Chris, are you a Christian? He said, am I what? And I got embarrassed and I shut down. I said, oh, don't worry about it. Let's just throw the ball. Go forward eight years, 15 years old. I was sexually abused by a Christian. Mm -hmm. Didn't even realize, I mean, I was so naive. Hmm. 60 seconds changed the trajectory of my life. Hmm. I didn't deal with it. I tell teenagers every day, if you and I don't deal with our emotions, 
they will deal with us. Yes, they, they do will. not just magically disappear. Yeah, it's like a volcano. You yeah. push them down one day, they're going to explode. They're explode. And, I, and the, the analogy I give them is if you have you got a trash can here and you keep putting trash into it, you just keep pushing it down and keep pushing it down and keep one day that trash is going to overflow. And when that happens in our heart, which is the centerpiece of humanity, that heart overflows. I've had, I, I've got that t-shirt. I know what that looks mm -hmm. like. That's mm -hmm. not a day you want to live. Me too, me too. So at 15 that happened, I don't tell anybody. 17 I failed PE, yet I played quarterback, taught tennis and played golf. I was pretty athletic, but I wasn't going to change clothes. It was a choice. Mm. By the time I was 21, I'd been in real, I, I was the youngest political consultant in Tennessee. My plan was at 21, I was running for the legislature. At 25, I'd be in Congress. At 30, I'd be in the U.S. Senate. At 36, I'd be governor of Tennessee. Mm. We had polling data. We had money around it. We, I had people telling me, you're going to lose your first race. You'll win your next ones. <clears throat> and then one day, uh, I was in real estate development, and we had whatever society says makes you successful. Right. Airplanes, condo, great-looking girlfriend, all the stuff. And I was so miserable. Mm -hmm. You can gain the whole world. That's but right. if you don't have this right relationship with Jesus, you're in trouble. And I'm not talking about religion. Right, okay? right. I'm talking about a relationship where you know you've had a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the person who loves you more than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So at 21, I say this very simple prayer. And there was no faith attached to this at all. Because here's what I couldn't understand. I go to church every time the doors were open, but I always walked out going, oh, that was the biggest waste of my time. Mm -hmm. We'd walk into church at you know 11 o'clock for a service, and if God moved, it was 12.02 when we left. Mm. 11 to 12, you're in, you're out, and everybody was just, nobody looked happy. Mm. They, they were just there. A form of godliness, no power. That's it. It was religion. Right. So at 21, I said this prayer, and it was very simple. Hey, if you're real, and I don't think you are, prove it. Wow. <laughs> don't ever ask God, the creator <laughs> of the universe, to prove to you that you're real, that I he's real. I something similar like that, yeah, but well, not quite as like. <laughs> well, my, mine was just, mine was proving stupid's a real word, to have that mm. kind of just it was courageous boldness that was driven by stupidity. Mm -hmm. But I really wanted to know. But, yeah. there, but I didn't want to know enough because I was like, yeah, you didn't hear that. So I just go on. I live for the next two weeks. It was a March afternoon. I'll never forget it. It was really beautiful outside. Wind was blowing. I walked into our office. Said hello to Sharon, our receptionist. Walked through a set of doors. Walked down a hall. Turned right. Went into my office. Shut my door. And I'm dialing a phone, checking on a shopping center we were building up in Beckley, West Virginia. And as I'm dialing that number, Behind me, off to my left, I heard someone say two words that radically changed me. And the words were, call mom. And I swung around because I'd heard that voice when I was seven years old. Same voice. There was no one in my office that I could see, but I knew to call my mom. I dialed three, four, four, seven, four, four, three. The phone rang seven times. On the eighth ring, my mother answered the telephone. And when she said hello, instantly I knew something was wrong. In that moment in time, when God, who's so very real, spoke to me and said, call mom. My mother was attempting suicide. Wow. She wow. was dying. Wow. And I could hear the life leaving her body. Wow. And in that moment, what do you do when you don't know what to do? You look for truth. Mm -hmm. I ran out of my office past Sharon, jumped back in my car, drove up Interstate 75, and I talked to this God I didn't know. And I didn't talk to him in King James. Mm -hmm. I was like, help, I can't save her. Mm -hmm. I didn't even think to call an ambulance. I got to their home, and as I drove into their neighborhood from the outside in, their home looked fine. It was safe, secure, probably like where you, where, where you live. But from the inside out, my mom was dying. Mm -hmm. I see millions of students. And from the outside in, they appear to have it all together. But from the inside out, they're in their own private wars. They're dealing with unforgiveness. They're dealing with rejection. They're dealing with not feeling accepted. They're dealing with suicide. Mm -hmm. They're trying to find out why they matter. And I got the answer. It's real simple. I beat on the door. My mom was barely alive at that point. She fell into my arms. I picked her up, carried her to her car, and drove her to the hospital. And on the way to the hospital, she said a sentence that just stunned me. She said, I can't be dying. I said, hang on, you're not going to die. And I was mad. But you're going to have to choose to live. Mm -hmm. The most important word in that sentence is not live. It is choose. The Bible is very clear. Choose, choose you this day. day. Yes. This is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment choice. Right. Get her to a hospital, a doctor stood me against the wall, rushed her to the emergency room. 45 minutes later, this doc walks over to my dad, has the most bewildered look on his face. And I will never, for as long as I live, forget what he said. He said, Mr. Sykes, there's no medical reason to tell you this. It's a, quote, miracle of God. Your wife's fine. She's alive. You can go see her. Wow. I heard miracle wow. of God. You I looked straight up to heaven. I went, crap, you're real. Hmm. You're wow. real. Wow. And my dad said, do you want to go see your mama? I said, no. Hmm. No, sir, I really don't. I said, I'm going to go for a walk. And Drinda, all I can tell you is I went, I could take you where I stood in Park Ridge Hospital, and I leaned against the wall, and I had an encounter with Jesus. 
Wow. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet, hmm. this warm oil hit me, and he began to talk to me. Hmm. And people go, well, I don't think God still speaks. Well, you're not wow. listening. Wow. He says, I've called you. I said, yeah, I'm going into politics. He says, no, I've called you. I said, no, I got a plan. He said, I understand. <laughs> I've called you. I said, well, what have you called me to do? Hmm. He said, you're going to go speak, but you're going to speak to teenagers. I said, no, not hmm. interested in that. Hmm. And it began a journey. He began to work on my heart. And to make a long story short, I went into full-time ministry out shortly after that with a guy named Phil Driscoll. And I managed him. I traveled the world with him. And then on January 1st, 93, I started our ministry. Well, go forward eight or nine, no, probably six or seven years. Um, Lori, my wife, and I were now married. We had our, two of our three kids. And I went to a Home Depot. Now, if you know me, you just fell over laughing because me in a Home Depot is just, there, there's no there's no way that makes sense, right? Not mechanical. Oh, I, this is what I know about cars. Oil, they need oil, they need gas. Yes. And I have somebody that makes sure the oil's changed and I put gas in the car. So beyond that, I am clueless on the stuff is concerned. And same thing with the home front. So Lori says to me, I need you to go to Home Depot. And I'm laughing, I'm going, sure, why not? Come on, let's go on an adventure today. So I grab two of the kids, we go. I walk down aisle 21, turn right, and walk right into the person who 22 years earlier had sexually abused me. Wow. I was wow. on TBN, Daystar, all the major networks. Every night I shared my story, I was reaching hundreds of millions of people. And I couldn't, I grabbed my kids' hands so tightly, they went, ow. I did an about face, went to our car, drove, how I even got home was just the mercy of God. Mm. Lori looked at me, she said, what is wrong? I said, not right now, after dinner. Put our kids to bed. We mm. walked outside, lived in this little house on our front porch. And she said, what is wrong? I said, you're the first person I've had the guts to tell this to. 22 years ago, I was sexually abused, and today I ran into the person. Mm. Then she took two steps back, her eyes filled with tears. She said, Dean, everything makes sense right now. It all wow. makes sense. Wow. She said, we gotta get you some help. I said, I have the spirit of God. I have the word of God. I'm fine. She says, well, clearly you're not, so let's figure out, we need some help. Mm. And that began me on a journey. And somewhere along the way, the Lord asked me this question, and it changed my life. Will you forgive the person who abused you? Hmm. My immediate response, being full of faith, speaking in tongues, doing all that I do, was no, I won't. Hmm. He said, why? I said, it's not fair. I didn't do anything wrong. Right. And then his response was, the audacity of God, was the cross fair. Hmm. Well, why did you have to go there? Mm. I mean, that's not even a, that's even a fair question. Right. right. I said, I'll get back with you because I wasn't going to lie. Right. Ananias and Sapphira lied and died. Right. I'm not doing that. I said, I'll get back with you. It took me three days. Mm. And after three days, I went back and I said, okay, I will forgive. And I could just see God going, this is so good. Now I can really use you. Mm. Because you see, when we get, when we take the chance, the opportunity to forgive someone who hurt us, we get free. Wow. And that's when it changed. Our ministry True. went into the stratosphere after that. Wow, and truly. I attribute it to just simply saying, I will forgive. That's wonderful. That's a long answer to your question. So the, no, that's fabulous. The passion was there, but then the compassion came in when that's you were it. able to forgive. Well, you just nailed it. You just nailed it. Yeah. The passion was there. I know, because I have a similar story. But the, when the compassion meets passion, mm -hmm. that's when God can move. Yes, yes. And so I tell that story every day on the road. And I, I got through sharing that one day, and a young man walked up to me. And he said, you told me that I matter. I said, yeah, I tell everybody that. He says, do you believe it? I said, no, I know it. He says, you don't know me though. I said, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible. It's not Job, it's Job 22, 28. And it says this, the spirit of God made you and the breath of the almighty gave you life. I said, you know why I can tell you without any hesitation or contradiction that your life matters? Because you're breathing, mm. just that simple. And he goes, <clears throat> I want to tell you my story. I said, I'd love to hear it. So here's the short version. He says, I'm a high school junior, got a 3.8 GPA, quarterback of the football team. We're playing for the state championship this Friday night. We're going to win. I've got a wonderful girlfriend, great home life. Then he just froze and his eyes filled with tears. And I've seen that look a gazillion times. I go, tell me about it. He said, I want to give you something. Okay. He reached into his pocket and this is, the, I carry it with me wherever I go. He handed me this 12 gauge shotgun shell. And he said today at 3.15, which was 240 minutes from when he and I were talking, he said at 3.15 today, I was going to the 50-yard line not to throw a football, but to end my life. 
He said, but you told me that I matter. So hmm. I'm gonna take a chance and believe you. Can I give this to you? I said, of course. I said, why were you gonna do that? He said, Dean, you can't imagine the peer pressure that I live with to right. perform. Right. The pressure to perform. perform. Yes. Golly, man. Performance-based Christianity will wear you out and it does not work. And the dread that goes with that, and yeah. it builds and it builds. And that's what a lot of our young people are facing in school. Yeah. They're facing this pressure from the culture. Yeah. And there's all this pressure on them to be bisexual, to be yeah. transsexual, yeah. to do this, to do that. And there's school teachers, sadly, there's a lot of good teachers out there, but sadly, there are a lot of them that have agendas. Oh, sure. And they're in there pushing, not only that, they're the ones, uh, I have stories in my book, molesting the kids, meeting the kids, you know, one, one high school principal, uh, mm -hmm. meeting a girl with, uh, you know, a grimace, I mean, grimace shake and, and chicken nuggets and a toy, you wow. know, because he's going to sexually have an encounter with this girl. I mean, in places that we think are safe to put our kids, right. I tell parents, you cannot trust institutions mm -hmm. to raise your kids, no. whether it be a school, you can't trust the trans clinic at the hospital. As soon as that child presents as being mental issues, they'll <coughs> tell them you're trapped in the wrong body right. and you should change genders and we're gonna help you know how to do that. And nobody's telling them they're making millions of dollars right. with these agendas and these kids are confused. The spirit of confusion is huge right now in the mm -hmm. whole culture and it it's is. attacked the kids. So there's confusion even over whether they're a male or a female. I mean, you can't say more satanic things mm -hmm. than that no. that you don't even know. It used to be like confusion Using for us, like just having that peer pressure in school, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where your locker is to right. get to class, the pressure to feel like, mm -hmm. do I wear the right clothes? Am I look, yep. Do I look the right way? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like with this or that or whatever, you know, my body. Now these kids are dealing with, you may not even be a male or female. Yeah. There's this whole spectrum to choose. And these, these uh, satanic inspired people are targeting the kids that are hurting, confused, don't know who they are, been through a breakup with their family, maybe divorce a situation or hurt or molested mm -hmm. and they're 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 in such deep pain yep. and then they're taking advantage of that and it doesn't it sound attractive to say you can change your identity change everything about your it's life. a it's a counterfeit for born again experience it is it absolutely because we all want a new fresh change we want to we want a fresh start we want a forgiveness but to tell a child changing your body cutting your organs off changing this changing your name changing your uh, your pronouns is going to make you feel like a new person and maybe for a moment it's exciting and it gives them a lot of attention right. but in the long run it brings destruction, oh, destruction. and death no and it's it's an awful thing it sterilizes i mean these are just horrible things that the church is, is even afraid to talk about they are and that that's the i tell parents when i do like parent type of just interactions at, at churches I'll, I'll say to them if if your teenager is always telling you everything's great no issues my life is wonderful you better start digging because they're not. I mean, it's, it's, we deal with things now 32 years into this journey of speaking in schools. I deal with things today that I never dreamed I would do. When, when I, the very first convention I ever spoke where I, with students, there were, I think, 550 students there. One had a cell phone. Hmm. One out of, and that was tw 32 years ago. Today in any school I go into, 99% of the students have their own phone. Mm -hmm. And so the internet if, if you believe the word, all things were created by God and for God. So God created the internet for his good, but the enemy has taken it like he does everything right. and he's twisted it. it, right? And so the internet was designed to connect, but it's the biggest tool of isolation that there is. Yeah. So teenagers, I share with parents if, and I share with students, if you're still counting your likes, if you're still liking, if you're still counting how many people are retweeting, how many people are following you, whatever that terminology is in today's vernacular. Mm -hmm. You're performing. You're performing and you're building your self-confidence on a false narrative. Mm -hmm. I've got so many friends on social media. Here's how my wife defines a friend for me. She says, Dean, do you know their middle name? <laughs> if you know their middle name, they're your friends. It's good to keep, keep ourselves grounded, oh. right? Exactly. Well, and you know, but we're not having those depth relationships right. with people that are real friendships with mm -hmm. a few people because we have this whole group of people that we're trying to please. Right. And people pleasing is in destruction. Oh, the scripture is. says oh. very clearly. Right? And I, so not yes. fearing the Lord, not honoring God, not honoring his word, but instead fearing man and people pleasing or performing, like you right. said. And it ends in a place of, you. I know as a high school girl, I was on top of the world when things were going great, when I was performing and everybody was happy with me. And then right. when my performance wasn't there, I was miserable, wanted to die. Yep. And it's this roller coaster yep. ride where 
every day you're living for somebody's approval for somebody whether it mm -hmm. starts with your parents and right. the school teachers and you know i was their pet and yep. and also the better you can perform the longer you can hide what's right. really going on inside so when it surfaces now it's volatile what it's is? it's not just a little thing that you no. need help with it's now i had a nervous breakdown in high school who has a nervous breakdown in high school and, and it, but it's real and here's here's one of the things that we're seeing whether it's a public high school, a Christian high school, alternative schools, juvenile detention center schools, we do all those, is kids are being abandoned emotionally. Mm, wow. Right? wow. It's interesting, when you, when you go through something, you minister from that perspective. And yes. I, I share with people, don't ever, don't ever try to minister what you're going through. <laughs> Wait till you're on the other you're side finished. of that, right? Because yes. it, it becomes a You have the victory. <laughs> yeah. But I was told by my mom, eight months before she died, she said, Dean, I emotionally abandoned you at four and a half years old. We have no relationship. You know it, I know it, stop playing games. Wow. wow. And I was like, and it, it took me so by surprise when I hung up, I was like, it took me about 30 minutes. I went, what could a four and a half year old kid do to cause that? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing, and, and that's, that's demonic. It is, and I have, that's, but that draws students in by the multiplied thousands, because they're like, that's how I feel. Like mm -hmm. I've been abandoned. Well, mm. we talk about that. On the other side of rejection, which is what that is, mm -hmm. is acceptance. Yes. And we are accepted in the beloved. Mm -hmm. And so I, I try to get young people to understand, you know, you can't give what you don't have. You can't teach what you've not been taught. Mm -hmm. you, the greatest commandment is what? To love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. The second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as what? As yourself. yourself. If you don't love you, you can't love. Right. And then it's just competing with people and it. trying to tear them down, which means we become the bully that hurts somebody else. Right. And then the Satan has everyone divided and attacking one another, confusion, you know, just, just that whole disgusting feeling of I hate myself. Yep. That's so, so much, I think everyone feels without God because they don't know who mm. they are. They don't have their identity. Right. So what do you, t you're going in the schools, you're sharing with them, you matter. What do you, what are you saying? Because I know you, you told me you ministered to someone that's transsexual. Yeah. And so all these kids are hurting. We see sin. Sin brings, uh, s Satan dangles the carrot, gets us to sin, and then he turns around and condemns us yeah. and beats us up and makes us want to kill ourselves and hate ourselves for the sin that, you know, he was trying to, to entice us with right. to begin with. What are you telling these kids? Because they're, they're in sin or they're brokenness. They're, they're sleeping with, you know, used to. I, as a youth leader, I, I said we occasionally deal with, you know, kids would use some profanity or they might get exposed to pornography. Or now kids are having uh, sexual partners in the multitudes and, and with both sexes and all kinds of crazy things we could never imagine. Mm -hmm. So how do you go in there and you're talking to them, you're dealing with there's a sin issue but then also there's a God loves you yeah. and how you reconcile with them. Yeah, uh, it's for me, I think one of the reasons teenagers really respond is I've always just been the authentic version of me. That's I don't great. walk in trying to look like a teenager. I walk <laughs> in kind of like this every time every <laughs> I go. And I don't try to change that. I don't, I, I j I'm just me. I like that. I don't read a speech. I mm -hmm. don't have notes. I have a microphone in this hand and a bottle of water in this hand and I walk and talk. And in that space, God uses words mm. to penetrate the heart. And I'm very honest with them. Sin is fun. For the love of God, it's fun. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Right. It's the wages of sin. It's the result of that sin when it catches up right. with us. That's when all hell breaks loose. Yes, when you can fast forward and yeah. see where it's going to go. So that's one of the things I invite them to go on a journey with me. Let's, let's, let's check our choices. Hmm. If you do A, you're going to get B, right? So if you're really tempted, the thing that you overcome becomes your platform. What do I talk about the most? Overcoming rejection, being emotionally abandoned, peer pressure, all the things that I dealt with myself. Mm -hmm. And so now when I get to speak with students, I encourage them, let's find out something good about your life. I've never wanted to be the I don't want to kill myself speaker. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about life and life more abundantly. Let's talk about what faith really is. Faith can't just be, well, I'm going to say this and so I, I'm going to sow a seed so I can get a harvest. That's a law. It's going to happen. Right. But if your whole world is based on, I'm going to give to get, I'm going to, so I can get more, I'm going to build my kingdom. It's you're missing, performing. <laughs> you're back to performing. And you're right. missing out what faith was supposed to be in the first place. Right. So I've got this crazy agenda. It's real simple. Can we just get young people to love God and love themselves? Yes. Not arrogantly, not yeah. pridefully, 
but find something that causes them to go, oh, that's why I matter. I'm breathing. It's mm -hmm. not about, I mean, for so long it was, well, if I, if I wear a certain thing, I'll be accepted. Right. If I drive a certain car, I'll be accepted. If I fly in a certain airplane, I'll, none of that. Those are just things. Yeah. It comes, God's not coming back for things. Right. And I tell people, if you're, if, if whatever you do in life, irrespective, you're going to be in the people business. Yes. And if you don't like people, if you get to heaven, you're not going to enjoy heaven. <laughs> That's the big there's a lot of people yeah. there. You know, I was thinking in the news recently, there's conversations. Obviously, it's still about Jeffrey Epstein. I wrote about it in the book because we're just a couple of miles from where mm -hmm. he did all of his, mm. his recruiting and lived and all oh, kinds wow. of things and the money that funded that. But now Jeffries, Mike Jeffries, who who ran, he brought mm -hmm. in to he brought in Epstein, right. and he brought in uh, Mike Jeffries to run Abercrombie and Fitch, and Hollister. And when I was a youth leader, those mm -hmm. were the those brands. Were yep. Victoria's Secret recruiting the girls basically mm -hmm. and getting them to be so overly sexualized and think that's what they ma they mattered about right. their body. And then you had the Abercrombie and Fitch, you know, the male models out there with no shirts on right. and the low pants and unzipped yeah. pants and, yeah. and th that whole image and facade that sexualized the men and pushed the, uh, the LGB mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. LGBTQ agenda. Yeah. Now they're pushing the, the T, right. but they were pushing the LBG at right. that part. And it's like, that's where all these kids' bodies, they were like, oh, I gotta look like the Abercrombie model. I gotta wear the right clothes. I gotta show up this way. It's still the root of rejection. Yeah, it it's is. still the root of the abandonment. It's like, I gotta matter. Yeah. I make myself matter by spraying the fierce cologne and wearing the t-shirt mm -hmm. and looking like the model. And now he's in the news for trafficking children as well as Epstein. And so it's like, wow, you have these people that are taking advantage of kids, right. taking advantage, they see and know Mm -hmm. that there's pain, yep. there's hurt there, and the more they can sexualize them and get them to sin, the more they can take advantage of them and sell them goods sure. and sell them transition surgeries and sell them on all of these things go back to that there's a sin, a brokenness, a hurt sure. issue, that abandonment, that rejection, the feeling of I don't know God and I don't matter right. and my life doesn't matter and I've messed up too bad. I remember thinking I've just messed up too bad and my prayer was, uh, God, I don't know if you're real or if you're there, or if you can even hear me, but if if you care about me, if it's not too late for me, would you help me? Mm -hmm. Very similar Very to your similar. prayer. Yeah. And also had a background, you know, when I was a child also molested and mm -hmm. also, you know, and those, those people, what we have to teach parents and grandparents is there are people who are targeting your kids because they know these broken things are going on and your finances are out of order, uh, you know, because we have all this inflation, which is intentional. And, and so you got moms and dads working, 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 and neither of them are there for their kids because they're trying to give them a good life. But what they really need is you. What they sure. really need is acceptance and love and a relationship with God. And when we're trying so bad, you know, trying so hard to give them the $150 tennis shoes or the jeans or whatever, uh, and, and make thinking that's going to give them identity. We're missing the mark and we're causing as much confusion in doing that. You know, yeah. I tell our kids, <laughs> I'm home with you. You know, we may not have all of those things that, but I'm here because I love you. And they'd say, well, mom, so-and-so has this game and they, right. they get to watch this movie and they get, I said, they don't love, they, they don't love their kids. Like I love you, right. you know, you just yep. going back to love and God, what God, what is God's standard? Yeah. We have such a, a world of orphaned kids. Oh, that's the word right there. It's yeah, an and, and Jesus said it. You know, the word says it's pure religion to take care of mm -hmm. widows and orphans. and orphans. I sat next to a trans, well, a young, a young lady who was trying to be a male mm. on a plane, and uh, uh, it was very pretty obvious. You know, she had the whole everything going on, and and you know, there's a profile of kids that fall into that. You know, they're broken, they're hurt, they're bullied, they've been possibly molested. Uh, they are into emo, they're into uh, anime and a lot of, you know, gaming, 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 you know, violent gaming. So these kids, she fit all the things. She had the clothes, the short the cut hair colors, you know, the tennis shoes, the, you know, the black and white vans, checks, yep. you know, the whole, the whole look. And I just started talking conversation. She had a, a sketchbook full of kittens and cats she'd drawn. Mm. So I just like, how do I 
common ground. Right. So I said, I have a cat. Do you have a cat? You know, and did you draw these? You're great artists, incredible. And I find the artistic kids, mm -hmm. talented kids, creative kids are targeted. Mm -hmm. They're the ones they want also to be their messengers. Well, they're influencers. They're influencers, exactly. And yep. the enemy goes after them. It's just like the whole Hollister, Abercrombie Fitch. They went after the influencers, the football quarterback, mm -hmm. the, the cheerleader, and, and use those kids then to sell the wares to everybody right. else. Just like Hollywood and celebrity culture sell the wares mm -hmm. to, the, to the kids now and the culture. But I asked her, you know, about her life and about her. And then I finally said, so uh, where are your parents today? Because she's without parents. She, she's, she's, you know, a young girl. She's 14 years old. She's flying, 14, 15, I can't remember. Anyway, I asked her. She goes, oh, I don't have parents. And I said, really? You don't? And she told me her story. She right. told me that her mother, and you hear these stories all the time. You know, she told me her mother left her when she was three, so there's the abandonment. Yep. And uh, for another man and family, rejection. started another family, so she's got rejection. And her father did something so bad to her that he had to go to prison. Mm -hmm. And so she's living with an aunt who's never going to get married or have children because she and her partner. Yep. And so I hear the whole, it's like the wonder, this child. Right. So, you know, in the conversation I told her, I said, you know, I believe God had me sit next to you. have been through a lot of pain for someone your age. And he just wants me to tell you how much he loves you and how yeah. he's there for you. And she goes, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. And, uh, you know, as we talk more, I said, well, he believes in you. Yeah. And he had me sit next to you because he wanted to let you know that you do, as you say, you matter. Right. And that God cares about you. And then he has a plan for you. And he's just a prayer just a, you know, mm. a call away. Anytime you want to call on him, anytime you want to ask him. And, um, you know, she listened. And, I, and, and as I'm talking to her, I'm like a mother. I took her by the arm and I heard mm. the pain she'd been through and just began to, and I saw her breaking a little yeah. bit, you yeah. know, yeah. still trying to keep up the, mm -hmm. the walls because yeah. they're afraid. Sure. They're going to get hurt. Yeah. And in the end, you know, I, I prayed a prayer over her. I did not feel that next step to take her. Mm -hmm. I was like, Lord, I so want, I want to, I want to get her saved. I want right. to get her. And I was like, the Lord said, you sow what I wanted you to sow. Yeah. Now pray for her. Yeah. So I prayed with her and prayed for her and uh, that God just, you know, minister to show her his love and help her and uh, help her understand who she is. And then when I said that, she's, she bristled, right. you know, she bristled. And then she pulls her little hoodie over her head right. yep. and goes to sleep. Wow. You know, and so you said you had a young man come up to you and ask you. Yeah, well, you know, we, here's some things I tell students all the time, two things, that hurting people hurt people mm -hmm. and pain seeks pleasure. Mm. So if, yes. show me somebody who's on drugs, somebody who's drinking, mm -hmm. somebody who's sleeping with anybody that walks, they're not bad people. They're in pain. They're in pain. Yeah. And so our job is to help them understand that pain can be turned into purpose. You can take mm. what you've gone through and it can become your launching pad. Mm. So when we get to see all of these students, you know, I remember the first decade of our ministry, I had an unwritten rule and it was this, I don't go anywhere that there's not at least a thousand students in every audience. So the first decade I reached a hundred thousand kids a year, so a million in the first year. And then the Lord asked me a question. And he says, how do you build a crowd? I said, this is a trick question, but I'm listening. I said, how? He goes, well, here's how I build a crowd. One person at a time. Mm. Let us never again be moved by the numbers. Mm. So I remember good, Dean. Before I had an airplane, I remember one day I was in Texas, I was in Dallas, and I was scheduled to speak the next day. And I drove all night, I'll never forget it, drove literally all night to Birmingham, Alabama, and I walked across a cow field to a little shack and there were two young ladies and they were the teacher at a teen challenge. And I spoke like I was speaking to 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And I left and I was so tired. The Lord said, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. I said, Lord, why did you have me do that? And here's what he said. I lined it up on your calendar because I wanted to see if you would do it. Wow. So what does God test? God never tests faith. Mm -hmm. He tests obedience. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The devil will test your faith. Right. God's not going to give you sickness and go, okay, let's see what kind of faith you have mm -hmm. to get healed. That's, that's, no. an incross, that, that's an insult to the cross. Exactly. But he will give test you an obedience. assignment and say, will you go do this? Mm -hmm. Will you say this? Even when it's uncomfortable. Will yes. you write a book that could yeah. freak most Christians out? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. but he found yeah. somebody who would do it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, Dean, I have people say to me, I went to a, a, t a TV station <clears throat> and they were like, uh, well, well, I said, I said, they said, don't talk about politics. I said, okay, can we talk about morality? You know, I mean, the whole Bible is about morality. <laughs> and then I said, in the second program, could we talk about the agendas against the children and what they're doing to them? Well, well we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. 
And I just was like, God, there's these kids out there. They're hurting, they're, well, they're broken, dying. and they're dying. Exactly. In numbers that we've never seen in history. Uh, and, and Christian organizations don't want to talk about any of it. They, they're afraid of hurting someone's feelings. What, who, what about the kids? What does Jesus care about? He cares right. about these children. He was very clear about that. He's very clear about it. And he said those that you know would harm them mm -hmm. would be better to have a millstone, millstone tied around their neck and, and thrown into a... In yeah, exactly. Oh. And so we're afraid. So yeah, it's bold and you're bold. And, and I wrote, they're coming for your children, the fight we must win. Because when I saw these agendas, and I saw them playing out in kids' lives and realized the church has no clue mostly. They're not talking about it and they're not speaking up against it. And not only that, they got a chapter in there, Woe to Church Leaders. We have churches that are embracing these agendas, thinking that's love. Yeah. And it's like, no, that's lust. And they're uh, forcing that lust on your kids and they're sending demonic spirits into their lives to destroy them. Right. So we got to wake up and know, I wrote it to expose it, but also to give advice. And that's one thing I want to ask you about too, is yeah. parents want to know what they can do yeah. and what can we do? Well, here's what, here's what I share with, with parents. What you compromise to gain, you eventually lose. Yes. Right? Yes. And so I knew our family needed to make some modifications when we were Lori and I have three kids, and so when we all, all of our kids were home before they all uh, have grown up now, I knew we had to make some modifications when I was downstairs in our family room and I was texting my son upstairs in his bedroom. Mm. I knew that when Will played soccer all the way from young, all the way through um, into college, and I remember I was, I was driving, take, I was taking him to soccer one day, and I got a phone call from, in my world, you would know the name immediately, someone very important, top of the food chain in our world. And I'm on the phone with this person, and you know, I would always pray for Will before he got out of the car when he go, when he go practice and play. And I said, "Well, I'll catch up with you in a minute." I didn't pray for him. And all the enemy's looking for is an entry point, yeah. right? Right. And a few minutes later, I see all these people surrounding Will. He's on the ground, and I'm I'm off the phone now, and I'm running towards him. And I go, "What happened?" He went, "Well, he got kicked in the head. I think it's a concussion." And he looked up at me and went. You didn't pray. Oh, no. <laughs> now, is there condemnation no, of that? No. no. But was there conviction? You right, bet. Right, right. Because what's important? So when I put my phone down and just hung out with our kids, that's when we had the greatest times. Us too. Us too. Lori would do this thing called high-low. We'd sit around at this big farm table in our, in our dining room, and she'd go, what was your high today? What was your low today? And, we, and everybody would say yeah. their highs or lows. And it, to me, at first, it was kind of, this is so silly. I mean, dear God, I'm on television. I mean, I, I speak to millions of people. You want to play high-low over a piece of grilled mm. chicken? Pan the highlight of our life. Exactly. Because it, what did it do? It invited community within our family. Right. Relationship. Relationship. And how do we share with our kids having a relationship with God if we don't have a relationship with them? Yep. That's the first place they have any relationship is with their father yep. and their mother. Yep. And if moms and dads are so busy trying to have everything designer and the two cars and the big house because they think that's going to make their kids have some kind of identity yep. and not have a mom and a dad in their life. Yep. And also, you know, the whole the whole attack against family that happened that I was part of in the 60s, 70s to destroy men destroy mm -hmm. male and exalt female and to make females a victim and turn against men right. and then to divide the home satan comes you know malachi says why did god mm -hmm. make the two one because he saw the godly seed right. well satan comes to destroy the family because he's after the kids he's after the yep. seed so that laid the foundation for the enemy to come in and today is the results of what we're seeing exactly. one of the things that i i say especially on sundays in churches is it's not how much you give your students, your kids, it's how much are you investing your life into them? Mm. Which I, takes sacrifice. Oh, you know, full transparency, that my camera, let me just tell you something, full transparency. Mm. You're looking at somebody who's done this for a long time. And I had to go to my kids, all three of them, and I had to repent to them. And I said, I missed it. I taught you how to believe God for stuff, but I didn't teach you intimacy with Jesus. I said, I didn't teach it because I didn't have it. I was so busy bouncing from country to country, city to city, state to state, reaching all these people. And God never asked me to do all that. It was performance based. Mm -hmm. I felt like I got to do 250 dates this year for him, for him to say, well done. Mm -hmm. It's when I went to them and said, I missed it. And I apologize. Trina, they began to come closer and closer. Because I had all three of my kids say to me, I don't want anything to do with ministry, mm -hmm. yours or any others. We love God, we're, we, we're serving God, but this isn't what we want. I'm like, look where you live, look what, you, where, what, look what your dad flies in. Look, all, 
Look how God has blessed us. Oh, <laughs> such a blessing. And it is. It, it is, is, but it's not the... But it's not the reason to serve yes. God. Yes. And so when we began, we, me, began to really make those modifications and began to invite them into conversations with, you know what? I can learn something from you. Mm -hmm. My kids send me podcasts all the time <laughs> from other people outside of my world and go, mm -hmm. have you listened to this? And I'm like, no, but I will. And I'll listen to it. And I'll go, man, that was great. Thank you so much. And so one of the things I share a lot is there's this little boy named Timmy. Timmy's a seven-year-old little kid, blonde hair, blue eyed little boy, and he loves baseball. And his dad teaches him how to throw the curveball. And he works hard all, all the time at it. And his mom and dad go to work and they come home one day and Timmy's been working all day on this curveball. And he says, Dad, I've, I've got to show you this. And his dad says, Timmy, after dinner, we'll do it. And they have dinner. It's getting dark outside. Timmy's like, come on, Dad, you got to come. It's, we won't be able to do it today. It's, his dad says, let me finish dishes with Mom. I'll be right out there. And he keeps per persistently coming. Come on, Dad, we got to go. His dad doesn't want to go. He's tired. He's got a stack of papers to go through. His wife's got work to do. But his dad notices a newspaper that he brought home with him from work. And there was a map of the world on it. He winked at his wife, said, I got this. And he cut the map of the world up into 22 pieces, put it on the table. Said, Timmy, put the map of the world together, then let's go throw the curveball. Smiled at his wife. She smiled at him, went, yeah, come on. It wasn't three minutes. Here comes Timmy. I did it. You did what? I put the map of the world back together. Timmy, there's no way. He said, come on, Deb. It's dark. Come on. His dad reluctantly walked across the room. Timmy, how did you know where Nigeria was to Nebraska, Australia to Alabama? And here's the key. Here's the takeaway for the whole day from me. Timmy said, as only this kid could. Dad, on the map, the back of the map was a picture of a family. And when I put the family back together, the world was okay too. Mm, that's great. And that's what we get to do. Yes. We get to help put families back together. And that is the crucial thing because the family is, the that is the beginning it's of the everything. Key. God started in the garden with a family, the man and woman, because he wanted a family. That's right. And he gave us that gift to be able to have children, to be able to have a family. I mean, what a gift that is. But Satan has minimized that. He's trashed it. He's tried to make the family a drudgery. He's tried to make it look like women. Your home is always going to be messy. You won't have the picture perfect magazine uh, bedroom and house. And you won't have the best clothes. And you're going to have peanut butter smeared on your jogging suit if you have kids. And this is a drudgery. It is the greatest joy you'll ever experience in your life is to have a whole family. Yep. And the enemy hates it, he hates people. We're made in the likeness and image of God. That's why he's targeting our kids. And I believe this generation is gonna bring back the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Moses, the deliverer, brought him out of you know, Egypt. Yep. Jesus, the savior, came to bring us out of sin and bring us into his kingdom. And I believe that God is bringing uh, his son back and yep. this generation is gonna bring his son back and they've been targeted and we must reach them. We absolutely must. And not only now do we reach our own, but there are broken, orphaned kids everywhere, everywhere we turn, and their parents aren't, you know, even around. Many of them are on are addicts themselves, mm -hmm. or they're messed up, or, uh, you know, we have story after story uh, of kids that have been broken and wounded and hurt. You see them more than I even see them. Uh, you know, we have kids that have come into our youth ministry since I was a youth leader when the issues were minor compared, mm -hmm. still the same roots. Right. But today, you have kids that will come, and they might be babysitting their siblings and they don't even, even though we have a home for girls they may not want to go to that home because they can't leave their two or three siblings mm -hmm. because mom and happen? her boyfriend are high all the time and they wouldn't eat or they would be abused or something and they're becoming the parent now they're trying to be in there and take care of their siblings and they're not equipped to do that and they're not equipped to do it and they're 14 years old 15 years old and they're bearing the weight of the world that yeah. is what's going on not in just San Francisco, in LA, in New York City, in the smallest communities right. across our nation. What used to be what we would consider more in the inner city, the brokenness, the drugs, the prostitution, the uh, you know one night stands, that is happening in every community across the nation. And it's happening in the school systems. The agendas are being pushed. The hospitals are transitioning kids. This is a huge money make. It's bigger than abortion. You know, we think, oh, wow, we won some uh, ground in abortion, but this is their new agenda mm -hmm. yep. uh, to push in the school, just like they pushed the abortion agenda when I was in school. Now they're pushing the trans agenda in the schools and it's targeting kids. And not only that, parents, we have a law right now trying to go into effect in Ohio, uh, you know, that uh, parents will have no say 
no say over whether their child has an abortion, no say over whether they transition. And any parent that doesn't affirm that is considered not safe. Wow. And Ohio is considered to be, you know, the heart of it all, well, sure. the heart of as the nation. Ohio, goes the as goes Ohio, goes the nation. So we're in a war. Wake up, moms, dads. Uh, if you would, Dean, I know there are parents who are already in tremendous battles over saving their kids, their grandkids. There's a huge gap that's happened in our culture. Uh, they're hurting people everywhere. And I know you pray. Would you just pray one sure. of those prayers and encourage people that they do matter? And maybe it's sure. mom or dad who are battling the same fears, rejection. Mm -hmm. That's why they're not parenting a lot of times. Well, that's why pastors aren't leading. Right. They're still battling those things themselves. Unhealthy teenagers become unhealthy adults mm -hmm. until they deal with it. And unhealthy attracts unhealthy which produces generational curses. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not rocket science. This is pretty simple stuff. It's just, can we approach it from the standpoint of what does the word say? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's your worldview? Open your Bible. Again, pretty simple. And so what does God hate? I want to hate. What does God love? I yes. want to love. Yes. God does not hate any person, but no. God hates sin. Yes. So I hate sin, but I don't hate people. Exactly. I have compassion for people. And maybe you're a parent today. Maybe you're just really going through it. Maybe you just have, maybe you're at, You've just, you've thrown your hands up and said, I just don't know what to do. Go back to what you do know. Go back to the truth of the word. Drenda said it earlier, God created families. Before he ever created a ministry, before he ever created a business, before he ever created anything, he first created family. He wanted a family, so he sowed the seed of his son. He could have sent the 10th or the 15th or the 100,000th out of heaven to do it, but he sent his very best. And he did it for you. And here's, I think here's the reality check for all of us. Can we take relationship with Jesus seriously? Can it be something that you embrace? Well, yeah, but I tried that. Well, there's your problem. The just shall live by faith, not try by faith. Well, I, you know, God doesn't love you. You're crazy. God loves you. You can't outrun his love. You can't do something so, there's nothing you can do to make him stop loving you. For one reason, he is love. When you are something, that's what you are. It's what you do. I speak. I'm a speaker, period. That's what I do. I open my mouth and I let God speak through me. So let's pray. Let's ask God to do the unbelievable because it's attainable. You really believe this? Yes, that's why I'm sitting here. It's hot in here. Of course I believe it. So let's pray, Father. And don't close your eyes. That's, I just get real frustrated over that sometimes. Just talk to God, Father. I need some help. I'm asking you to show up in my life and do what I can't do on my own whether it's my kids, my marriage, my life, my job, I'm asking you as I bring it to the foot of that cross to just say, I give it to you, and you say to me, I got you. Just if I know that you've got me, I know I'm going to be okay. I want to know you more. Here's how you know God more. You get into his word, and you read it, and you speak it out loud, and you ask God to just become so real to you. I've done this. That's why I can speak about it. He does. So, Father, in Jesus' name, wherever they are, whatever they need, I'll set myself in a Matthew 18, 19 faith agreement that according to your will, it happens in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. There is no law against love, <coughs> but True. we're not to embrace the sin and accept the sin. We love the person. We love them. We love them the way God loves them. And when we do that, we can speak that truth they need to hear with love, but until their eyes are open, they can't even see anyway. And sure. so praying their eyes be open, their heart be softened, and that they have eyes to see and ears to hear what God is saying to them. You and I can't manufacture it. We can't make it happen. We can't force them uh, into a relationship with God, and we can't do it by legalism and by restraints and by anger and by religion. It doesn't work. It only works with the love that God gave us and the love that he showed us that while we were yet sinners, mm -hmm. Jesus died for us. And sometimes that love will require great sacrifice. And if you're a parent, a grandparent, there is no loving your child without great sacrifice, without laying your life down. And we wanna take the easy way, the shortcut, the uh, I call them nasty nannies in my mm -hmm. book. When we give over our children uh, to do our job to nasty nannies, doesn't mean there can't be people to support and help us, but we better know who's teaching our children. We better know what's being spoken into their lives, yeah. what they're learning about God, about themselves, about sexuality, about every issue in life. 
because Jesus told us that when the student is fully trained, they will become like their teacher. So who's teaching your children today? So Great I word. hope it's you and I hope it's the word of God and I hope that you are engaged in a church uh, that teaches the word of God uh, and that you are modeling for kids by example. We miss it at times, Dean mentioned that. And I missed it with my kids at times. And I'd have to sit down. My husband and I would sit down. We'd apologize to them. We'd ask for their forgiveness. But then you have to be wise after that. Uh, you are still the parent. Right. And you can't let them manipulate you and control you and use your weakness or your failure to take charge and, you know, mutiny you as, a, as the pastor, as the leader, as the uh, pa parent. You must make a decision. God gave me this leadership position. I'm gonna do it as well as I can, give it my absolute best with his grace and help to do it. And when I fail, I'm gonna get, re I'm gonna repent and I'm gonna repent and I'm gonna get back up and do what I'm called to do. And so today I encourage you to do that. We don't need parents to be friends to their kids. I'm friends oh, now, true. my parent, my kids are all grown. And it's awesome when you've been a parent to them when they're little, that you can be a friend to them when they're an adult. But if you're not a parent first, they so don't need parents, they don't need friends, they need parents, right. they need parents. Forget Freud, forget all those lies in psychology. The kids need a parent and they need to know the one, the father, first and most importantly, but you're modeling his love and his actions and what is right and what is wrong to them every day. And so I uh, thank you, Dean, for praying. Thank you for joining me today. I encourage you. Dean, how do they get to know more about your ministry? The easiest way to do that is use our website, youmatter.us. Youmatter.us. And I encourage you to uh, take advantage of any time uh, Dean is speaking and bring him into your local school. He has a way he does that. You can do it in public schools and Christian schools. So, and Christian kids are struggling too. Don't think because you put your kid in a Christian school that that absolves your parenting responsibilities. They're struggling. Dean is seeing the same numbers in Christian schools uh, pretty much as he does in public schools. And so we have a job. It's a big job. It can look daunting, but God is, uh, his grace is sufficient and will give you the ability to do that. I encourage you to go to Dean's website and uh, take advantage of his resources. And until then, let's stay on guard. We'll see you next week.